Dr. Hayes, thank you for accepting our invitation. Um, I'd like to start not necessarily with a question, more with a with a thought, I would, I would guess, but I have an army of patients who are, for the most part, waiting to feel better, and they're putting all their, their faith in medication changes that happen monthly, and that 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 better that, that good feeling doesn't come before they go about their lives you know and um and i felt the message you sent in your book uh and with the acceptance and commitment uh, therapy seems to be a very valuable strategy you know to deal with that inertia and with the, the misconceptions about emotional pain and suffering that, that we have would you would you agree with me i do agree and you know feelings are here for a reason uh they ebb and flow and they give us some direction not in a one-to-one -one way what they're doing is they're echoing parts of our history uh, including just our biological history but our history we've had as individuals into this present moment and so they're kind of like a warning light on your car or you know a gauge uh, uh, on, uh, on, on, on your um, computer or something. They give you information. But what I think um, has happened is that we've gone through a period in our world where uh, people are taught that the emotions should be sorted into good and bad, like and dislike. And a really successful like, life is that you have almost only the good ones. But that would be like saying, well, I want to drive a car that never tells me that uh, my oil pressure is low. It's, it's not safe. You, you want that there. Of course, it's a problem to see it or the warning, the engine light has come on. It's a problem, maybe, kind of, sort of. But then you have to interpret it. And so I think we've done some things in the modern world that have fed kind of a feel goodism instead of uh, do a good job of feelingism. You know, you want to be able to have your sensors there. And metaphorically, you know, if you look at, you know, why leprosy leads to loss of digits, it isn't just the necrotic process. People do dangerous things with their hands. They leave, you know, their fingers might be in a fire or in, in the car door and you don't feel it. And and you you lose your fingers. We, absolutely. We, we have a lot of metaphors like that in the medical field. One of them is diabetes. You don't feel your feet, you end up hurt. Or, and uh, another example is opioid users have more joint problems because they don't have the feedback. Of so, course. So, so, and, and that's what psychiatry has become. It has become this let's suppress emotions. For as long as you sit and you say, I'm feeling something, uh, of negative nature, you know, you and, and probably one of the things that are leading to polypharmacy nowadays and all this yeah. blunt, blunting of, of emotional intensity. I agree. I mean, and, and if you if you take something like uh, antidepressants, I almost don't like the word because marketers came up with it. It didn't used to be called antidepressants till later on. Uh, but these uh, bring the bottom up, no doubt. They also bring the top down. Nobody wants to market them as anti-joy drugs, but if you look at the sexual side effects and the impact on the full range of emotions, you know, when you head towards the happy numb, you're not headed towards happiness. Plus, you have now have greater difficulty in being able to read what's going on in the moment. That doesn't mean that medications don't have a role. They do, I think. In uh, you know, so your depression, where you're more limited dosage, you're tapering, you're being mindful, and you're including the psychosocial supports that will avoid the long-term side effects of simply medications and will give people tools they can use to navigate this world of emotion. But um, it looks as though in the modern world, we're going in the opposite direction. Uh, and that's arguably part of why, if you look at whether or not just in terms of incidence and prevalence, are we getting better or worse in the world over the last 20, 30, 40 years? Answers are getting worse. Um, the episodes are stickier, they last longer of depression, for example. And the, the number of persons who are suffering, anxiety, depression, etc., goes up, not down. That 
It doesn't look like a progressive story. And in other areas of medicine, it's not like that. It's not like that with cancer. It's not like that with heart disease. Why are we the ones? And maybe it's because we're doing some things that are unwise in terms of the evolution of the human being and our bodies and minds and the role that some of these events play that are sometimes targeted, I think, too strongly, too long, too intensely for the good of the individuals that we serve. Very good. And um, how would acceptance and commitment therapy work as an antidote for that, considering that we are looking at a problem that is is coming from every angle, possibly as a result of cultural changes, possibly, though, and clearly those cultural changes are affected by um, the fact that they're, you know, the United States is one of the two countries where pharmaceutical companies can actually advertise directly to the consumer. Um, yeah. But um, how can, because we are mental health professionals, we should know better. It, it, it turns out we got caught in this avalanche of misconceptions and we started to repeat the same things patients repeat after they watch TV. And we, you know, we what happened, right? So I guess my question is, how, if you can guide our listeners to understand what acceptance and commitment therapy is, how is that an antidote to this uh, um, aversion to actually living life in its plenitude? Well, let me answer it in a, a little bit of an odd way, and then I'll come back to the pointed question you, a, you asked. In other areas of academic medicine, when we run into cul-de-sacs, into dead ends, we usually go back to the basics. We go back to the lab. We, we start looking at our assumptions. We start looking at underlying processes. When oncology hit a dead end with simply naming the color and shape, and so forth of, of lesions. They went back into the, the lab and oncogenes and now epigenetic regulation of cell growth, et cetera, have come in and your chance of surviving leukemia, so many things are orders of magnitude higher now than they used to be. Um, we've gone through a, a period in uh, psychiatry and psychology of botanizing human suffering. And we call it botanizing because that was the phase that botany went through. But botany eventually realized we, we we're not going to be able to organize this with just pink petals and blue petals and five four petals and four petals. We're going to have to know the underlying genetics. And then even that wasn't enough because you can have toad flax and pyloric toad flax and the flowers look completely different and they're genetic, genetically identical, absolutely identical. It's an epimutation. They're epigenetically different. And it's passed on across generations. Now it makes perfect sense. And Linnaeus and Darwin, who is this a different plant? I didn't know where to put it. The basic lab has given us the answer. In the same way, I think we're now in an era around the world where mental and behavioral health, academic psychiatry, psychology, etc., the best researchers, most forward-looking, having done full genomic analyses and many of the things that we hoped would give us easy solutions. We realize we're in for a hard pull. This is not easy. Uh, genetics are part of it, but it's massively polygenetic. It's massively responsive to uh, uh, parts of the genome that regulates other parts and, and the epigenome that does the same. And the cells are systems for turning environment and behavior into biology. And that means we now have to think in a multi-dimensional, multi-level, systemic way. It can't be, it's not a simple answer. There are no simple answers, they're gone. We're going to have to think in terms of complex networks evolving. Now, when you do that, uh, what we have done in the ACT community, earlier more often than any of the other psychotherapy interventions, uh, but now in community with the rest of the, the psychosocial uh, interventions, and including also, I think, the best of our medications, and, and our uh, more biologically oriented uh, colleagues. What is the smallest set of processes of change that we can focus on that do the most good? And ACT tried to distill that down. We've just com recently com completed a review of every randomized trial ever done in the history of the world with the psychosocial method targeting a mental health outcome that did mediational analysis, that properly done 
analyses of the functionally important pathways of change that led to the long-term outcomes. And we only included ones that have been replicated at least once because there's clear evidence of p-hacking and of people sort of later on worrying about process, but their main focus was on our technology. And I can sit here and tell you that the processes that are targeted in ACT, that are psychological flexibility and mindfulness, account for 55% of everything that we know about the functionally important pathways of change in psychosocial interventions to mental health outcomes. Now, to get specific, in, in, and by the way, if you expand it just a little bit, if you think about it just a little bit differently, you can go from 55% to about 82%. And I'll maybe give an example. So I'm really not here. I'm not very interested in act, qua, act, 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 act. These words pass away. Castles in the sky. Everybody wants to be immortal, but everybody dies. Uh, but if we can put something into the scientific community of processes of change that can be identified in your patients that create problems or prosperity and that can be changed reliably, Part of that can include medications and the important role of um, the psychosocial methods. Then I think we have a chance to really move the effect sizes and, and get off a period where for 40 years our effect sizes haven't gone up one bit. If anything, they've gone down. And uh, what are those processes? What is psychological flexibility? I can say it in three sentences. Learning to be more open with your emotions and thoughts rather than being rigid in those areas, being able to bring attention into the present moment, inside and out, voluntarily, fluidly, flexibly, from a more conscious, noticing part of you, less the persona, the storied self, but more just awareness, and then deploy your behavioral resources, the things you do with your feet, directed towards the things that create intrinsic meaning and purpose. Six things together. The first four are mindfulness, pretty good definition. That's 55% of everything we know. Those three sentences I just told you is 55% of everything we know. And if you just do a little more, you want to talk about reappraisal. Yeah, that's cognitive flexibility. That's how that really works. You want to talk about rumination and worry. Yeah, that's attentional inflexibility. Disappearing from the present into the conceptualized past, or remembered past, or the feared future. Then it goes all the way up to 82%. So our 40 or 50 years of wandering in the wilderness and hoping that syndromes would give us diseases that never somehow showed up. So we never went from topographical units from the pink petals and the blue petals to functional units, the real ideological mechanistic course in response to treatment and mechanisms for it, knowledge that we need, the functional knowledge as professionals that we need to really do a good job. Um, did give us, no, not psychiatric diseases, but it did give us a very small set of processes that we can target and change. And when you do that, oh, great things happen. And if I could cite just one study, is it okay? Just one study? I was going to ask you about when you're going to publish that. And, uh, and I want to know more about it. What kind of, uh, um, uh, even though knowing it's a process based, and I would like you to give yeah. a very digestible explanation of what that means for our listeners but i also want to ask you about that same study that meta-analysis is uh, yeah. what kind of a diagnosis syndromic diagnosis people were uh what banner were they marching under yeah so this was the entire set if you had any psychosocial intervention with a randomized trial properly done with treatment as usual or waitlist as a control, you need that two active treatments. When you look at the differences in processes, and many national analysis can say, oh, there is no process because they have the same processes. So you really want to compare it to waitlist or treatment as usual, uh, and then later get to two active treatments. And so we looked at uh, every diagnosis, every intervention, every study we could find in the entire world, 55,000 studies that we read twice and scored. And uh, it took us three years to do it because it's such a huge thing. It took 50 of us working on it to make that happen. It's published in Behavior Research and Therapy. If, if it has a very odd word in the title. It's easy to find. If you just search for my name or go to Google Scholar, you can find it under my name. But you could also just search for the word idiomic, I D 
I-O-N-O-M-I-C, which is a combination of ideographic and nomothetic, because we uh, are trying to focus on processes that apply to the individual, but do help now understand in terms of the subgroups you're a part of, but without ever fuzzing the individual and treating them as an error term. And that's a larger conversation about why you want to do that. So uh, that is, but let me give you one more study. This one, only one. World Health Organization came to us years ago, said, we want a process-oriented approach to deal with victims of war. Why? Because every syndrome you can name, plus all the kinds of things that are not syndromes happen when war happens. You know, diet, sleep, and exercise out the window, relationships breaking up, angry outbursts, suicide, of course, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, all those things. On and on it goes. And I said, yeah, I think we can help you. Focus on the processes of change, because I think psychological flexibility, if you can get it into the human heart and head and hands, will help people who are escaping from war. So they have put it first with South Sudanese, South Sudanese refugees going to Uganda, and then Syrian refugees going to the EU. They did four gold-plated, this is World Health Organization, I mean, to the nines, double-blind, controls that you could only dream of, you know, if you give me enough grant money, uh, randomized controlled trials. One of which is the one I want to mention to you. With, um, this was done uh, with Syrian refugees who had escaped with nothing but their lives. And um, they looked at people who had not yet developed, other studies, they had looked at people who had already developed a diagnosable condition, mental health, a mental illness. Uh, and then they looked at one year later, and what did they give them? A cartoon book and an audio tape, because people are mostly illiterate no. in the South Sudan, etc. And it was not given by psychiatrists. It was health workers who usually had a high school education. 50% reduction in a one-year follow-up of mental health problems developing compared to a pretty well-designed con control condition. So I'm back to, you know, processes of change can allow us to not just treat, but also to deflect the development of mental uh, health uh, problems. And uh, the if you go to the World Health Organization site, it's now distributed in 30 different languages. And here's what it says, almost word for word. This program is good for anyone experiencing stress for any reason in any situation. It's the only thing like that you'll find on the WHO website. And it's not me saying it, it's the World Health Organization. So I think we have a, a pretty important message here that we can do better by focusing on processes of change and giving people the tools they need to live rich and satisfying lives. So so the message, if I have to teach someone uh, that is uh, uh, that has a only a rudimentary uh, training in psychotherapy is to keep in and the spirit of the message will be to keep in mind um, accepting emotions and and being open to change. Like because really, as I frequently say, constancy only exists as a concept. But I dare to say, after listening to your TED talk, um, powerful, powerful TED talk, that you knew that before this data was collected. When you went to do this meta analysis, you already knew what you were going to find. I suspected it. I was shocked at the numbers because I thought uh, we just don't have enough research yet. We'll find some interesting things. It'll be all over the map, but that's good. We'll start with what we know. And then instead, we had this very unusual clustering where, you know, one set of processes was doing so much uh, uh, better. Of course, this is a measure. We were just looking at the ones that were statistically significant, were properly done. And... Um, so it, it would be even harder to look at effect sizes every attempt that had ever done a mediational analysis. We didn't do it that way. So it is kind of also a popularity measure. So don't be hearing me saying that we know that it's the biggest and the best and the most effective. No, it's just the most replicated. And based on the data we have now, it tells you that um, 
in terms of knowing why change happens, 55% of what we know uh, is captured by this. Now, if you're, if you're not too, you know, much into psychotherapy training and so forth, there, I think there is some, a fairly simple message, which is everybody I'm talking to knows that there are times when you're all more open to your internal life, and there's times where you're more defended and closed. Uh, how do I know that? Well, one thing I ask people to show me with their bodies, them at their best and them at their worst. Do this with your next patient, with your next session. Just do it. Just try it. Show me with your body, with this issue, once you get clear on the issue they're struggling with, as if you were like making a statue with your body. You at your best when dealing with that issue. Now you at your worst when dealing with that issue, but don't change the issue. And we've done this around the world. And around the world, what happens People at their worst, their head comes down, their eyes close, their arms and hands come in, they bend at the waist, they may fall to the floor, they may clench their fists, they, their, their jaws tighten up, they're in a defensive or uh, protective or uh, aggressive sometimes posture. At their best, their head comes up, their eyes open, their arms and hands go out. They may stand up, walk around, their hands and their feet go out. You just score people. How open or closed are you? How aware or unaware are you? How ready for active engagement or disengaged are you? And 95% of the people around the world ask that simple question will show you more open, aware, and actively engaged postures. Look, we already know it. And we know something about how to produce it because how did we know to put our bodies there? We were watching our own behavior. We could tell. But the organ between your ears tells you when pain happens, you have to run, fight, or hide. That's often not true. You need to show up. You need to weep. You need to find your friends. You know, my brother died uh, one, two, three, 11 weeks ago. Walked into a hospital with a bellyache. Less than a day later, was dead. I was there with my hands on him when he took his last breath after emergency surgery. Oh, it turned out he had massive, massive pancreatic cancer throughout his entire colon, which had intersuscepted, collapsed on itself. And uh, he didn't know it. He was symptom-free. Um, I feel very sad saying that to you right now. I can imagine. I'm sorry for your loss. Yes, of course. And I also can smile when I go to the basketball game, because I can almost hear him screaming for my beloved wolf pack when we watch the game. Uh, I, I can draw strength from this uh, honorable man and how he was in the world and how kind he was to everybody, to animals and birds and children. Um, is my sadness something that should consume me and something that should be dampened down? I'd say no. It isn't just sadness. It's a rich soup. That sadness contains a smile. Do you know what I mean by that? It contains appreciation. It contains honor. Uh, it contains uh, love. And the modern world has to learn how to teach people to allow those little lights in the front of our car to give us information like that. So sometimes it's painful information uh, an almost one-to-one -one correspondence, how painful it is to be there and see my brother die is how much I love this man. It's the same, you know, the poets have been saying that forever. Some of our best psychotherapists and Leaders over the years have said that. Why are we so stupid? You know, that we think we have to immediately go to dampening it down, dampening it down. Now, of course, if you're getting overwhelmed and you can't, of course, of course. But then make sure we do both. Yes, maybe. Is, is that what you refer to as a values-based life? Values-based life. It's very close because that first thing of being more emotionally open, not wallowing, more cognitively aware, but not entangled, uh, that allows you then to come into this present moment, even though it contains some things that are painful, 
fearful or fearsome? Everybody looking at your television screen. Is there anybody? Uh, are you there in Brazil? I did you said you you have a right now? No, I'm Brazilian, but I'm in Rhode Island. Okay, well, if you were in Brazil, uh, my wife is Brazilian, so uh, you have it. You know, you saw what was happening. Where it's similar to January sixth recently, of course. Whatever side you are, and there you're worried about our world. Yeah, I mean, I'm worried about Brazil. Um, so just as an example, uh, when you show up in the present moment, it'll contain painful things. Uh, through these years of COVID and so forth. We've all learned that. It isn't one out of five. It's five out of five, all of us. But now you said, it isn't that values? I'd say yes in this way. When you're more emotionally and cognitively open, when you're more in the present consciously, you could afford the risk to care. Until there, you can't. If you want to just do a little test of this, ask your next, next client, to tell you their deepest values and learnings, the, th the things they, they yearn for that they almost are so close that they it's a secret. Like it's almost like they don't for fear that it won't happen or for, for the pain of even knowing it. It's hard to say. It's hard to show up. It's hard to even tell your friends that what you really hope for is this. Yeah. If uh, if you ask that, you'll get long periods of silence. You'll get people saying this is a very intimate question. They'll say this is a very hard question. They'll sometimes cry and say, I haven't thought about that in years. Why? Because they've been so busy not feeling what they think, thinking what they th think, being present to what's present, that they couldn't afford the risk to care that deeply. So values are showing up and in this case with my brother yes yes i think the pain of that reminds me once again how important love is in my life and uh you know i came home from seeing my brother die and i, and I hugged my 17 year old boy of course i did because that's a reminder yeah that life is short Take advantage of these moments. This is of importance. Not in some desperate, obsessive way. No, in this softer way of inside our pain, we find our purpose. Yeah. Stephen, it takes guts to do it. And, and, and uh, the matter of fact, it, it, it takes more guts not to do it, but people don't know that. But to embrace change, to embrace flexibility, to be where you got now. One thing that I always ask myself is how to inspire patients to embrace these things, to take the leap. And, uh, and my struggle with that is that, I, so I was a psychologist before I went to medical school, right? And, um, and for me, it's like, um, I see other forms of, forms of art, music. I, I have had patients that will come back to me and say, man, I listened to the song and it, it touched me and I decided to do this. And I was like, huh. And I'm one year there, right? Sort of punching a wall. And, um, and one thing that I noticed, in, I've been a psychologist since for actually 22 years. And uh, one thing that I noticed and, and I, I want to mention my wife, she's a, she's a psych nurse practitioner. And, and she's one of many people that I've noticed that inspire folks. And what I found is that the most inspiring therapists or providers, prescribers, psychiatrists, you name it, are the ones that are living it themselves. I don't know how that is communicated to be honest but there's a light about folks like that you know look at what you're just telling me this it gives me goosebumps and and it, it, that kind of stuff is and and if you don't put that into words when you're working with someone you don't say well you know i just came back from what i went through and I, you, you don't do that you just you are just you and then people around you kind of gravitate towards realizing that there's no end point. It's change, is transformation, is is a fluid thing. 
but how to get there, how to, you know, because some folks are so born ready, I feel at times. Yes, I I think it's in our cultural traditions, our wisdom traditions, our spiritual traditions. It's, it's in art and literature and dance and music, you know, and has been right along. Yeah. And the modern world sometimes overwhelms it, I think, with a commercial culture of feel, of feel goodism and so forth that is uh, harming our children. You know, if you look at the levels of suicide and so forth, they're at levels that we've never seen before. You know, 10 to 12 year olds, 500% in suicides, actual death just over the last few years. That recent study that just came out about teenage girls, levels of unhappiness they've never even seen before, measured before in the developed world with everything. Yeah, but not everything, because I think we've cut off sometimes some of these sources of wisdom, and we have to do it in a different way. We may not do it through church, for example. Church attendance just goes down and down and down every year. Fastest growing group is none of the above. Um, and I'm not singing the song for, for theism or religion. I didn't come here to do that. I'm a scientist. I'm a you know a therapist. But I do have to look at, say, well, what are, used to be there that's no longer there? There are some great positive things inside our connection that's possible with our, our iPhones and, and all of the rest. And I'm very hopeful about that. But when you say, well, then how do we put that in there? It isn't that it's inborn. It's already there. And we in the scientific community and then in the helping professions linked to that can filter out some of what's most important and some of the things that are maybe not so important which you can't do in a, for example, in a, just a wisdom tradition or a religious tradition. They're all bound together. There's many, many different things. There's rituals, there's dogma, there's, you know, heroes and saints and so forth. And But in there is something that's important, but it's a lot of things that aren't important. And of course, that has been true in academic medicine. I mean, you could have things that are really important along with, you know, mud baths. I mean, it was, you know, just historically in terms of learning how to take things out is important as sort of finding the things that are, that might be helpful and then inventing new ones. So here would be my quick answer to you as one of four big ways that I know. Uh, think of an area where you're struggling or, 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 or there's an issue. And, and without overthinking of it, if you could pick one hero or guide, somebody that you know about, ideally someone who knows you, but it could be something that you, like a spiritual guide or somebody who's dead and long gone, but you've read a lot of it, of that person's work or whatever. Who would you pick? Well, think of a whoever you just picked, when we unpack it, those will con that person is manifesting values that you have and want to manifest. It just works that way. You don't pick people because they're driving a Cadillac. You just don't. You know, if you're struggling with the meaning of your work as a physician, you don't pick somebody who has a big, gigantic house. You may pick somebody who's very humble or somebody who took the time to look you in the eye and help you out as a medical student or, you know, your mother or... Uh, an old girlfriend used to have. I, I don't know what you're going to, but you're going to pick somebody. And it's one of four ways I know to do this. It's a really quick one. Now, if you slow it down and I say, okay, what does that person stand for? What a, If you had to sort of list in your mind what, a, what that person means to you, why they are an, a guide or a hero or somebody you look up to, you have your answer. Now, the issue is how do you put those qualities into the next moment. And then the one after that, and the one after that, knowing full well you're fallible and you're going to slip and fall and you're not going to do it perfectly. But over time, with a direction, better and better job of creating habits. So even when you're mindless, you're still kind of doing what you really want to do. And you might pick somebody who, for example, you know, never became all prideful about how great and grand they are, let's say, you may pick a supervisor or somebody who really took time to listen to you and find out what your life was like. And not, I'm just picking one, just an example. How would you put that into your behavior 
maybe not in exactly that form, but the deeper thing of concern for attention to and uh, uh, a kind of a, a, a gritty getting with the needs of other human beings. Could you do that with your next patient? Could you do that with a nurse? Could you do that with a psych tech? Could you know, maybe? Well, now you're on a values based journey and you're going to find yourself times where it's hard to do that because emotional flexibility is not there, cognitive flexibility is not there, attentional flexibility is not there. Well, then you have to work on those. I'm and very curious about the other three ways. Say it again. I'm very curious about the other three ways to do it. Oh, okay. Well, here's the four that I know of sweet, sad heroes and stories. Those are the four that I know of. I just did heroes and guides. Sweet. Uh, um, let's take one and work. Most people are listening to you because this has something to do with their work. They're hoping that between you and I will say something that will be useful to them in their in their role as a professional. Name for me a time when you felt especially connected, lifted up, vital uh, in your work. A day or a moment where, boy, this... This is sweet. You know, this was what this was about. This was why I became a psychiatrist. Why I became a physician. Why I went into this field. Unpack that moment, that sweet moment. You'll find values in there. Take a place where it really pains you, where, think, where, where things are hard and difficult, and where, where sadness, anxiety uh, show up. Difficult emotions or difficult thoughts, or difficult memories, or difficult bodily sensations. Now, get clear on those, flip it over, and ask the question, what does my struggle with this suggest that I care about? And you'll find something's going on. Like you're looking at a panic disordered person recovery. You mentioned my TEDx talk, one of two that I've yeah. done. Yeah, when I flip my panic and social anxiety over, I find yearning to be with and be useful to people. And in the story I tell in the TEDx talk, I eventually dig down and find an eight-year-old hiding under the bed when they're my alcoholic dad and my OCD and depressed mom were fighting with each other in such a way that I really feared they might be physically harming them, each other and wanting to do something. Yeah, And so I've dedicated my life to doing something. I couldn't do it with them safely. Thought about it, but I stayed underneath that bed because I knew I might get hit if I left. Um, so sweet, sad, heroes. And then the stories one is just like, if you think of your life as a story that you're writing and you don't get to decide the actors or the episodes, but you do get to decide the theme and what genre it is. You know, so you're writing a tragedy. You're writing a hero's journey. Um, what's your intention for the next chapter? I find a lot of commonalities between the things you're saying here and um, Jung, yes. for example. And, um, and and I think that's that stems from your inclination to look to the to the process as opposed to the syndrome. So like, what is it that it works? That that is exactly the definition of process based therapies. What is that we're looking for? Whatever, if you have a, a, a picture, if you have a shrine of Skinner or Jung or or Freud in your house, it doesn't matter. That's the stuff. That's the core of it. That's beautiful. Absolutely. I really agree with that. And, you know, what I've found with my colleagues as we've moved in a process direction, and all I mean by process, just from the word Latin word, it means a procession, a sequence, a parade. That's what process is. What is the procession or sequence of biopsychosocial events? It could be brain circuits, could be epigenetic regulation, it could be uh, relationships, it could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, social support, it could be a therapeutic alliance, it could be uh, the psychological processes I've just talked about under the label of psychological flexibility. So all levels, suborganismic, all the way up to the, the groups we're part of and the psychological level. What are the biopsychosocial processes that would move us forward toward what that client really wants? Now, they come in saying, I just want to get rid of the pain. But, you know, 
I've, I've, I've taken that. You can even do this in the first uh, session if you want. It's a little risky, but you can do it. I say, well, what kind of pain? Ah, oh, anxiety. I hate anxiety. Okay, I'll tell you what, dude. I got here a magic pill. It'll eliminate anxiety from your life. Never happen again. However, before you do this devil's bargain, I have to tell you, like all stories that are like this, when you make your wishes, you know, they usually, you know enough fairy tales to know that there's a, there's a cost. And here's the cost I'm going to have to tell you. When people around you are feeling anxious, when your child comes to you and is afraid, when your friend doesn't know because they're bound up with worries and concerns, you will have no idea what they're talking about. And you will be able to give them nothing. You going to take the pill? I've not met a client who takes the pill yet. They want the magical one where I get to eliminate all the emotions and maintain the wisdom. And it doesn't come that way, my friend. Your emotional life allows you to connect in consciousness with others. And so many people have said that. I mean, the Victor Frankl's of the world who went back into the concentration camp risking his life and spent the rest of his life helping people who felt they had no way out. And here he was in a situation where he had no way out, but maybe he could get out. And he said, no, I'm not going to leave. My patients need me here in the concentration camp. I mean, if we look at our heroes and look at our the people in our field who have really made a difference, and you mentioned some big names. They all did, didn't they? They were all heroes of, a, of us in a deep way, I think. Um, so, yeah. Um, Let's find a way to not let our heroes be creating islands where we stand in isolation from others, but dig down to the underlying processes of change that might be important and build bridges to those islands because you'll find wisdom is all around you and you can use it. You may find it in your the poetry you read or the movie that you saw or the music that you listen to, or yes, you can may find it in a textbook by Jung or a book by Victor Frankl. Considering that your work with ACT, with the acceptance and commitment therapy, and your work with research has um, distilled all this knowledge and showed like, hey, I, I have it. I'm holding it in my hand. Before it was a pile of mud. It's, it was inside of it. Now I know exactly what it is. And that probably is going to result in, in some a fair amount of people in our field is going to have a shrine with your picture and, and the things you say, considering everything you have done. But My knowing... wife hits me over the head when people say that. It says your, your head's getting too big for your hat. <laughs> <laughs> but, but knowing that these things were there, what happened to us? What happened? I, I, I gave a webinar a few days ago, and, and I, I ended it with, with this. I said, we're standing on the shoulders of, of, of geniuses, of people that could see reality at different layers. And, 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 and they all believe in the human capacity to grow. Yeah. And now, in my field, what we do is we repetitively enable a passive position we we don't believe people anymore they come and they say i'm feeling this and then so there's this pill there's no question i have i have seen a lot of people work because i also i mentor a lot of people and i discuss mm -hmm. these topics you know having a podcast like this has got me to lose a few friendships and 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 what we see is um i can see someone coming and saying well i haven't been doing very well and the immediate answer is oh well maybe we should increase Alexa, sure, or sure. as opposed to say, why? The, the very basic and what and and how you're going to overcome how we got what what do you think? How do we got here? As a profession, how we got there? Yeah, well, and, and it's so, unfortunately it's true for psychology as well in psychotherapy. Yes. You know, uh, there, there is this understanding that people just can cope, and there's a, 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 a there's a, a a lot of us has become have become professional enablers. 
I think that's true. And uh, I'm betting on a couple of things because I'm hitting a point in my life where time shifts and you start thinking not how long is it going to take to do that project to how much time do I have left to do that project? And I'm turning 75 my next birthday and uh, retiring as of uh, July from my academic appointment and putting all my effort into what I'm about to say, which is uh, not just processes of change. I think that's a big focus. And I'll answer your question about what I think is going has got, happened professionally. But I think uh, the other is that uh, we need to go back to the early days of some of our scientific decisions and, and look into how did we get into normative categories as a primary way that we think about human suffering and human beings. That was set up, it was given to us. It was given to us by our biostatisticians and by our, our research leaders. And we were told that, I mean, the, the very effort, for example, to take signs and symptoms, turn them into clusters, that will maybe give us the disease entities that are latent and hidden within them is a particular scientific strategy that is based on normative categories leading to functional understandings. Uh, that journey, uh, do you know that in English, the word normal wasn't in the dictionary until 1848? You can hardly have a table conversation without normal, usual, average, typical. It didn't exist. Uh, the first real application of human beings, it came in the dictionary primarily because of uh, some mathematics that came in more into common usage in the 1860s and 70s. With the arrival of a statistical understanding, bell curves and standard deviations. The person who started it was Galton, Erasmus Darwin's uh, grandson, just like Charles Darwin's grandson, they shared the same grandfather, had different grandmothers. Uh, but uh, they were cousins. And the idea was, is we knew through the psychology of individual differences where people land, we would be able to predict their future. If you're on this part of the distribution, you have one, if you're on that part, you have another. And the whole concept of abnormal, we say abnormal psychology easily, right? Do you know you can't sell a book on abnormal psychology anymore? The kids won't buy it. They refuse to buy it. They will buy a book called Psychopathology, but even that has begun to come an issue because the world has changed. And here's one thing that I want to tell you. In this 10-year journey I've been on to chase processes of change, to dig into our randomized trials, figure out really what the functionally important pathways are, to distill them down to the smallest set that does the most good in the most areas. I run into the statistical fact that you can't predict longitudinal processes from where people are on the distribution between people, unless the phenomena is what's called ergodic, E-R-G-O-D-I-C, look it up. Statistical physics figured out in the 1880s, proved it in the 1930s, and it's a talk to any physicist friend of yours. They know the ergodic theorem, they know its implications. And the first person to notice that applied to living creatures, that happened in 2004, it just happened 18 years ago. Here's, and it's, it is a required assumption of all the statistics that lead to all of the categories that are in the DSM, all of the categories that are in our personality tests, all of the categories that are in our IQ tests, all of our categories that are in our developmental milestones that our pediatricians happily tell patients and send them off to a physical therapist if your baby isn't crawling by age 12 months. On and on and on it goes. It's built into academic medicine and all of the life sciences. Here's what, and, and you know a little about it if you don't know, take any stat class, you heard something called homogeneity. <laughs> the assumption of homogeneity. Underneath that, unbeknownst to almost everybody, is the assumption of ergodicity. Here, here's this what ergodic phenomena is. There's no trends, and the same dynamic model applies to every individual unit. So, for example, if you want to if you want to assess a volume of gas and predict what the molecules of gas do, you can do that, but only for a few gases, because lots of gases will show you different dynamic models, models molecule and molecule, and it won't be stationary. 
noble gases now most of the noble gases are ergodic you can do it with ergodic with life forms look are we stationary no we're changing processes of change is that stationary no it's changing does the same dynamic model apply to all well if you're treating frozen clones yeah my guess is nobody listening to me is treating frozen clones so here's my i can't fully unpack this but Friends, here's what I got to tell you and what's, what's coming down the pike and what I'm spending the rest of my life on is that we have been sold a bill of goods by the statisticians who convinced us that your place on a bell curve predicts your future, where what we really need to do is model the change processes within the person over time, which any good clinician does. Ask the good questions. Watch what happens week to week. You can even now do it statistically with ecological momentary assessment data and with new statistical tools that are about being developed or that exist now. And then look at the things that move the person up and look at the things that move the person down and build the ones that move them up. Uh, now, uh, here, here's the kicker. Why did Galton and Carl Pearson and R.A. Fisher, and Frank Yates, and the people that you learn in your stat books. Why did they not know this? Well, let me just ask you, what were they professors of? Do you know? Math. You'd think, math, statistics, yeah. Eugenics. Eugenics. You're kidding me. No, I'm not kidding you. If you dig into the history of academic psychiatry and academic psychology, and the USA is the worst, don't be blaming the Germans. The Germans took the laws written in Virginia word for word to begin to require the testing of everybody who came in and then produce their mercy hospitals where they'd tell the families, we'll get specialty treatments here, but no, each nurse got a list of who would die that night. And they were chained to chairs and put out in the in, on the porch to freeze to death or wheeled down to the pit to be burned to death. It, that was the, what led to the Holocaust. But it started with the mentally ill. It started with a war on abnormality. But it started, you know, the 60% of the presidents, the American Psychological Association from 1892 to 1947 were a eugenicist. So here I went in, I'm going into a territory now that I didn't mean to get into, but we need to show up to the history of our own disciplines, grab it, and rework it. I mean, Bluler, schizophrenia, first person to use the word, right? Textbook on psychiatry, 1924. We need to prevent them from having any children. I mean... Diagnosis was a weapon to keep people down. And uh, Galton's first book on hereditary genius said, what we need of is the upper white uh, classes of the UK. That's basically what it said. And here's how we're going to get there. We're going to get there by sta bell curve, standard deviations, and specifically putting in policies so that only the best are allowed to breed because we're devolving. So the first instance of applied evolutionary science was this horror. I want us to now get on top of evolutionary science. Evolutionary science is the right way to think about it. You talk to your cardiologist and you say, why? For three questions, eventually they say, because it evolved that way. You know, why does the heart do that? Why does that do that? Why is that? Because it evolved that way. We don't do that in psychiatry and psychology. We need to learn to and to put not in just this gene centric idea, but this multi level, multi, uh, multi dimensional evolutionary process of healthy variation that's selected and retained and fitted to context. Healthy variation emotionally, cognitively, attentionally, sense of self, motivationally, behaviorally. Pick the winners, retain them, and fit it to context because nothing is good always and everywhere for everything. And where we're there, we can evolve on purpose, not in that, you know, kind of uh, 
you know, Star Trek way that you'll become the spiritual things and float off the planet. And no, it's not like that. We're not going to evolve that way. We can evolve within our lives. And through epigenetic processes, even have a bump. And through cultural processes, have a bump on the lives of our children's children's children. And so I hope I haven't given you a geeky answer, but it's... Uh, uh, no, we, we, we're... Uh, <laughs> It was it was quite impressive. I'll tell you, um, uh, we've been fed a bit of goods as professionals. We swilled down the Kool Aid. We have big economic interests that are only too happy to feed us uh, answers that they make a lot of money off of, based on this idea. And it's mathematically impossible. It doesn't meet our needs as clinicians, and it never will. The, what the ergodic theorem says: it isn't just that it's wrong; it's irretrievably wrong. It's wrong at the level of mathematical assumptions. And so time to push the reset button. And for me, that means processes of change now done ideographically scaled to subgroups, but only if they help you see the individual more precisely. So the individual is solid. The group is the error term. It's upside down statistics. Don't be bringing the group in until you really can model that human being as a complex system. And we have the statistical tools to do this. So I think that's going to bring us together because processes already make it easy. We stop fighting. We have different names for processes, but we fight over our packages. We fight over our diagnostic impressions and stuff, but we don't fight over processes. And then once we get ideographic linked to nomothetic generalizations, only if they help us see the individual, we now have a, a tool that allow us to fit our knowledge to the needs of the people we serve. It's... Breathtaking. Um, what will take for us to transform our field and embrace? And this is a question I ask frequently. You know, I was interviewing um, um, Dr. Timimi uh, a few months ago, and he's of the opinion that we have to rebuild the training from the bottom up. And um, I just. And what I told him is that, you see, I was called an activist, but I'm a strategist. I'm just trying to do the doable, so stop hurting people, because we are hurting a lot. Psychiatry is hurting terribly. How do we go about, because my position was the opposite. I think we have to sprinkle, sprinkle from the top, because, for example, I don't have stomach for academic life. And, um, and uh, most people in academia in my field, they are, uh, you know, well, they get their grants for research and things like that. So there's, how do we go about to spread this? How do we go about to sp spread the simple complex, that the simple concept that people are complex? And, yeah. and the result, the, the, the answer is not one uh, neurochemical or uh, uh an area of her brain where you put a a, a, a a TMS coil and you know it's it's so reductionist. How do we go about yeah I not but I'd be careful. I wouldn't say the answer is not those things. It's not only those things and certainly not a they have a use. No 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 don't get me wrong. They all have a use, you know, and, and, and I'm a shrink after all. But uh, how do we go about embracing the complexity of things? Here here's what I'm betting. What I'm betting is if you can give tools to practicing clinicians where their clients can get better, faster, cheaper, reliably, empirically, and without singing some La La Land Pollyanna song, and without requiring years of training and subtle discriminations, but no, these are real numbers and, and statistics that can be applied almost automatically so that we can take advantage of this new world where we do have big data, we do have artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms, we do have the chance for your iPhone to be sitting next to you when that next client comes in and sort of holding your hand and saying, this is the problem for this one, You know, which our diagnostic system doesn't do. We, we pretend it does, but the DSM-5 work group said, and at the beginning of the of the of the DSM as a book. It says, don't apply this as a method to pick treatment. That's not what it's for. Well, then please give me something that is for that because I need that. And so if if something I've said is interested people and they want to follow me, if I can just say the words, I don't sell things, it's it's a one great. Thing. 
I'll, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say this: people go on Amazon and write Stephen Hayes whatever shows you buy <laughs> because it's worth it. I've been no, reading, I, I have been reading your work for twenty years now. Go to my website at www.stephenchayes.com. Click on yes, please send it to me. What that will do, I will send you a newsletter. Why am I saying this to you? Because. I'm retiring in July. I'm president of a 45-year-old 501c3 called the Institute for Better Health that a guy named Jerry Piaget developed all the way back in the heyday of managed care that has been producing quality mental health training, uh, professional training for those 45 years. We will release either at the end of Q2 or the beginning of Q3 of this year an, an app that will allow you to simply ask your clients to record their experiences once or twice a day. If certain processes have changed, you can put any processes you want in it, but it'll come with ones that are preloaded that we think are important and with outcomes that are important. And then with a button of push, at least some, and then there'll be a website to get more, data analyses will come back that will say this. You need at least 30 data points to make these things run. 60 is better. So it takes two or three weeks of two or three times a day to do it. Well, it takes a couple minutes. If the clients know it's really important for you, they do it. And the reveal is wonderful because you can sit down and say, look, here's what's happening in your life. I'll give an example. At the Evolution of Psychotherapy, big psychotherapy conference in Florida, I did a reveal with a client who had given me three weeks of data three times a day. I talked to her only five minutes to get the goal she had, which is she wanted to consider her needs, not just the needs of others, because she would get into a space where she's just trying to please everybody. And next thing you know, she's not taking her health. She's, she's not sleeping well. She's not eating well. Her family's you know, in second or third place. It's like enough already. This is I don't want to do it. I don't want to live my life that way, even though I'm a busy professional. I bet you some people listening to me do that just that sometimes they when they let themselves get stretched thin and head towards burnout that way. So we fed it with the processes of change. I had mentioned psychological flexibility. We have two measures that, that we fed with it that are uh, really good for high density longitudinal data. Yeah, so I I guess sit on stage and I'm talking to her and I say, here's what happens. Here's what the network shows. You stop considering your needs when you get hooked by difficult thoughts. And when that happens, if you remember what your values are, you're okay. And especially if you engage in some kind of health practice, I don't know what it is, but it's right in there. It tells me you're doing something to help you with your health and that's protective. But if you kind of forget what's deeply important to you or you get hooked by those thoughts, oh my God, you're out there just kind of, you know, you know, serving, <laughs> to the point of exhaustion. So what are you doing? And she said, that's exactly right. You know, I get these thoughts of, you know, I won't, they won't want me as an employee. They won't like it if I do, da, 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 da. And, and then I said, well, what are those health practices? I have a, a, a yoga practice. If I do my yoga practice, I remember what my values are and it kind of gets me in touch with my body. I can kind of feel what's going on. She said, that's a diagnosis. To me, that's a diagnosis done this now with hundreds of people. And you know that the STAR-ED trial where 3,700 patients had 1,100 different combinations of signs and symptoms? Of course. Of course, yeah. It's if, from, if you're just looking, it, we, can, we can't. It's, yeah. it's, our syndromic diagnoses are very limited. Before you get to comorbidities, 1,100 different combinations, just of this limited set of signs and symptoms, never mind what their values were. We didn't even ask the questions anymore, you know. And almost half had a combination that was so unusual was shared with one one hundredth of a percent of the population. It was only four or five other people out of three thousand, a little bit above one one hundredth of a percent. But you know, I think anybody looking at that knows that's not a diagnostic system; it's a general. Yeah. In no other area of medicine would we call that a diagnostic system. That level of comorbidity and that level of lack of specificity. And 40 to 50 years of failure and getting down to the functional units, that's the whole purpose of it. Yeah, but if I can, I, I, when I'm giving a lecture on this, I show an example of one where I had a client, uh, not a client, but a, a subject in a research study who was distressed over sadness. But their particular network, using these really advanced stat methods, it's called a group iterative multiple model. 
name. We've invented several simpler ones just in the last three months. We're, we're very busy creating ways to do this. This person, when she got distressed over sadness, stopped connecting with other people. When she withdrew and stopped connecting with other people, she started feeling as though she had nothing meaningful in her life, no challenges that mattered. When that happened, she spaced out. She was no longer even in touch with the present moment. She went mindless. She was off in her head. And when that happened, she's distressed over sadness. That's evolution gone awry. That's a self-amplifying loop. That's one diagnosis. And the word depression so poorly gives you an idea of what went on. But anyone listening to me, if you've been listening carefully, would know, well, maybe when she gets distressed by sadness, we should help her reach out to people that she loves and cares about. Maybe when she's withdrawn from others, she should connect with what her values are. So the next thing she's doing is personally important. Maybe if she loses touch with what's personally important, she should have some mindfulness skills to at least show up in the present moment and see what's going on inside and out. To me, the treatment utility of a functional analytic diagnosis that way, which is where evidence-based therapy started back in the 60s, but then couldn't figure out a way to do it because all they had was direct contingencies and they didn't have the stats to do it is a far, far, far better diagnosis uh, in terms of functionality and treatment utility. So my hope, my cross my fingers, I hope it happens, but I'm working my tushy off to make sure it does with my colleagues, is that if clinicians are given the analytic tools to walk away from Galton's eugenic dreams and to walk into the individual human lives of the persons who are in front of them. I've not met a clinician who doesn't have a heart for those people in front of them. Yeah, you burn out and you forget it. You forget why you went into the field. But that's but you went into the field for a reason. And it for sure wasn't the money. <laughs> you made a pretty bad judgment. You could have been a lot more successful money-wise doing something else. But I that's... My hope is that can we reach the heart of the practice community and give them the tools to generate the knowledge that through big data and AI and the rest, these apps we're developing will put identified data into a database controlled by scientists, not by commercial interests. I spent two years arranging how to do that. I'm sure it can be done. We do not need Google to have yet another tool to manipulate us or Netflix either. But uh, maybe the solution isn't the scientists as much as the practitioners. Start collecting the data, looking one at a time. And if that lifts you up in your practice, and now you're empowered, and you're going in there excited because you know you're not going to be, oh my God, I have to raise your medication is the only answer. Can be an answer, not sometimes. Sometimes. Um, that'll be fun, wouldn't it? Dr. Hayes, you don't disappoint. I'm going to tell you, I had high expectations for this interview and, 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 uh, and they're nothing compared to, to what you just did now. I, I want to say again, fantastic message. I really appreciate. I'm going to tell my listeners again, um, inform yourself about the act, inform yourself about process-based therapy. He's uh, Dr. Hayes research. Dr. Hayes, Thank you very much for your time. It was a journey. Really awesome. Thank you for the opportunity. And let me just say one little thing. We know that learning about these processes and putting them in the lives of others helps you put it into your lives. And if you want to see the randomized trials on burnout among psychiatrists, I will send them to you. Amazing. Please. We're, you know, last time I checked, it's like our work is done by people. And psychotherapists and and psychiatrists are people too, and so uh, can we can be in the wonderful position of actually helping meet our own needs by learning better how to meet the needs of others, and that that's pretty cool. We're pretty lucky. If if that if that doesn't motivate us, nothing will. Thank you. Thank you very much.